Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. I'm with Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah, who retired in 2008 uh, as Deputy Army Chief. Several awards and distinctions to his credit, including the Param Vishisht Seva Medal, the Seva Medal, the Vishisht Seva Medal. He fought in the 1971 war against Pakistan in the famous Battle of Longewala. He has served in several parts of the country, in the Northeast especially. And in 2002, when the riots in Gujarat were taking place, General Shah was sent to Gujarat on the 28th of February, just when the Godhra, uh, the, the train at Godhra was burnt, the 58 car sevaks were brought to Ahmedabad, and we all know the story thereafter, the riots that, that consumed Gujarat thereafter, and which have since put uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, then the Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, which have uh, followed him um, these years since. General Shah, welcome to the print. Thank you. So, General Chaz, you've written this book called The Sarkari Musliman, which will be launched in a few days. So, first of all, tell me, General, why are you calling? Are you, is this you, the Sarkari Musliman? Yes, that's me hoisting the tricolor. Oh, that's you. You are ho hoisting the tricolor. Tricolor in Aligarh Muslim University Historical. That's right. And you were also right. Vice Chancellor of AMU. That's right. But why do you call yourself the Sarkari Musliman? No, I don't call myself a Sarkari Muslim. Okay, so, why is this book called? It is because my father was called a Sarkari Musliman. Okay. Uh, in uh, 1954, right. when he had been sent to take charge mm -hmm. of the shrine at Ajmer yeah. uh, and tried to streamline things, right. the entrenched interest there, the Khadims or the equivalent yes. of Pandas, yeah. resented uh, government control because mm -hmm. it was free for all. Right. So they called him a Sakari Musalman. Uh -huh. He's pushing the government agenda. Or he's a government stooge. Right. That's what it implies. But do you think that Muslims in our country today, that it's increasingly being used as a pejorative? Uh, no, not really. Not really. So let me just explain okay. Okay. Uh, fully. Uh, so it struck me. And then when I was a second lieutenant, I happened to meet some very strapping young lads. Uh, who were horsemen from Aligarh Muslim University. It was the AMU riding team. Mm -hmm. They had come to participate in the Indian Military Academy horse show. Right. So I felt it's a good uh, captive audience. And I told them the honor and glory of uniform. Mm -hmm. And I told them you can't get a fairer deal anywhere else. And I said, we are looking for polo players. So they shook their heads. At the end, I asked them, uh, how many of you want to join? Not a single person raised his hand. So, in unison, they says, I said, don't you believe me? No. They said, sir, you are a Sarkari Muslim. Sir, you are a government stooge. And that struck you? So, it struck me. And since then, I said, if I ever write a book, I'm going to call it the Sarkari Muslim. Okay. But there are two types. There are two types of Sarkari Muslim. Muslim. One is the government servants who don't pander to the illegitimate demands of their community. Right. So, when you don't, you're called, no point. Don't go. He'll never uh, give it to you. The other is people who have sold their souls. To whom? Well, sold their souls to, I won't say to, to the devil, but they've sold their souls. And I classify Salman Rushdie. That's right. Born Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, Taslima Nasreen, born Muslim. But why Salman Rushdie? He's a great uh, writer, a literary Most certainly. He did across the Most world. Most certainly. He's a great writer. But that unreadable book of his, which I've read, unfortunately, the oh. satanic verses, okay. because the Ayatollah banned it. Yes. The biggest mistake made was banning the book. And I read it because of that. It is unreadable. Have you read it? I haven't read it because it was banned in India. As well, you know. it was unreadable. Yes. Uh, he decided that being a born Muslim, uh, although he's disowned the religion, uh, it, he would be able to cater to Islamophobia. Islamophobia. You Islamophobia. He was, he was deliberately catering to Islamophobia? Absolutely. And so does, uh, see, I respect uh, Taslima Nasreen for the stand she has taken on, uh, you know, on various issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I respect her. But what I don't respect is her Islam bashing. Okay. Uh, which I feel... You think she does it deliberately? Of course. It's a good way to, to for Luca, for getting um, assignments for getting attention and uh, writing contracts. So neither Salman Rushdie nor Taslima Nasreen? No, both of them no. are, are Sarkari Muslims uh -huh. uh, uh, of the derogatory type. Okay. And the good guys, people like you? No, I won't say I'm a good guy. 
but uh, and I'm not a Sarkari Muslim and I don't intend being one right. because I went according to the rules. I just stuck by the rules, right or wrong. And um, people did call me a Sarkari Muslim, mm. but that's all right. Does it hurt sometimes? No, it doesn't. I, I treat it as a jest. Okay. I laugh it off. Okay, so before I come to um, asking you about the Indian Muslim, let me ask you, you were a, um, you served in the army all your life, you retired after 40 years. But let me ask you about 2002, you were then posted... I, uh, no, I was, in, commanding, I was commanding a division, which was, Rajasthan, which, was, Rajasthan. which was positioned in Rajasthan, it's part of the strike corps. Right. So we were meant for the offensive against any visualized offensive. And this was, um, it, just to, to remind um, um, our this audience, was this after was Operation Parakram. Operation Parakram, after mm -hmm. the attack on the Indian parliament. In the, on December 13th, 2001. So immediately after that, then Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee decided that the Indian... A repost was required and yes. we, we, were positioned, we were mobilized and moved. So then you were asked to go to, from Jodhpur, when the riots broke out in Gujarat, you were asked to go to Gujarat immediately. The riots broke out on 27th of February, uh, of February after the dead bodies were brought. I think it was a blunder to, to have brought them in a convoy uh -huh. uh, into, but that was an administrative decision. Uh, but anyway, it inflamed passions. People who saw the trucks and the, and the bodies, uh, obviously their passion got inflamed. They should, it shouldn't have been done. Anyway, I... So you reached, when did you, when do you reach Ahmedabad? I reached Ahmedabad, see, let me give you the, the whole chronology. On 27th evening when I was, uh, I had just attended an exercise, mm -hmm. I get a call from General Padmanabhan. Uh, he, then I, chief of us. Then chief. Uh, it, I was a little surprised because uh, generally we follow the chain of command. Sure. It should have been to the command headquarters, to the corps headquarters and then to me, to the divisional commander. Right. But he says Zoom, that's my army name. Every, You're called Zoom? I'm called Zoom. Uh, Why are you called Zoom if I may? Well, I was in the relay team in school. Okay. So, uh, so everybody has a name. So General Padmanabhan said to you. Zoom, get moving, get your troops into Ahmedabad and he says, cut out the, the riots. So I said, sir, it'll take me 48 hours to reach. He said, don't worry, the Air Force is laying on the aircraft. Okay. So I, I said, right, sir. Uh, I uh, sent a message to my deputy, GOC, mm -hmm. a brigadier. I said, get the troops moving. We were already uh, mobilized. And I got in, into my gypsy along with my ADC. And I reached um, the airfield at about 10 p.m. Okay, this is on the night of the 27th. 28, 28. Okay, on the night of the 28th of February. Night of 28th February, I reached the airfield. The in air, in, in No, no, in uh, Jodhpur. I see. The aircraft were coming in, Air Force aircraft. Sure. And uh, I didn't wait. I took the first aircraft with the troops who had come and I flew into to Ahmedabad. The rest of the troops, about uh, 3,000 of them, came onto the airfield and 60 flights brought us in. Total are 12 companies, uh, no, 6 but 24 companies okay. of the infantry were flown in on that night. Mm -hmm. um, so when do you reach Ahmedabad? Do you reach I, I reached at about a, a midnight of 1st, 2nd. Okay. 1st no, or 28th, 1st. Okay. I reached at midnight. So, so the Deputy GOC of the Formation uh, Brigadier Mera met me. And what did you do? Once you reach Ahmedabad, yes. your book says that you reach at... Um, around 1 or 2 yes, a.m. around that is. And what, so what I, happened? So I was expecting the transport, the magistrate, the police guides and the communications to okay. be there. Mm -hmm. I found nothing except sure. a brigadier. So I says, where's all the logistics we had been promised? Well, he says, the state government will arrange that. I've got nothing to do with it. So I said, where's the chief secretary? He says, uh, he's abroad. Who's officiating? He gave me some number. I tried to call, call, call. There was no reply. So I thought the best our way to handle it is to go and report to the Chief Minister. Then, so I asked for a guide. then Chief Minister uh, Narendra Modi. Modi. I know Mr. Narendra Modi. Uh, a guide was there and I reached his house at 2, at 2 a.m. on the 1st of March. Uh, we traversed through horrendous sights. There was, uh, curfew was supposed to be informed. Police there standing with lattice. They had not been issued weapons. Uh, the mobs burning and rampage. Uh, and pillaging um, uh, property. What were the police doing? They were doing nothing. They were just standing there. 
Okay, and you do, drove through. The I drove through all that. that. Uh, I, I drove through the map. They didn't touch us because they knew we were the army. And I reached the chief minister's residence, and I told him that there's terrible uh, mayhem going on. You told the chief minister. I said, and I said uh, he obviously knew it. I said uh, we had been promised these things; they're not there. And I said, where are the trouble spots? I had taken a tourist map, sure. but I didn't have a map of the city, so we plotted out. Um, so who else was there? Yourself? Yes. Fortunately, there the Raksha Mantri was there, Mr. George Fernandez, looking very worried. Mm -hmm. And so he was already there. At Narita. He was already there. They were eat, eating a late dinner at 2 a.m. So I joined in, and um, then we decided. So we yourself, were, George Fernandez, and, and then Chief and Minister Chief, Narendra Modi, yes, three of you. All then. three of us were there. We decided on the deployment of the army, and I requested immediately. I said, we need the transport, we need magistrates, police guides, communication. And he agreed. He said yes, they'll come. So I headed back, I, the troops landed, and uh, we kept waiting, nothing came. So then what happened then? So we were at the airfield, and that morning then Mr. George Fernandez came and addressed the troops at about 10 or but 11. You, but you stayed on the We airfield. stayed on the airfield. I mean, where, see, in a city, where do you go on foot? We don't know. We don't, we don't have So guides. no orders were given to the Indian Army, to yourself and to your... Troops. No, I was given orders. No, but to come into the city and to clear I the I didn't guys. have the wherewithal. I was given clear orders, curb the violence. But where do I go? Okay. Without transport, without, uh, without uh, you know... So whose responsibility is this to have given you the wherewithal? Well, it was the state government. I think it was a failure of the... The chief secretary was not there. So I don't know who the chief minister gave orders to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was a case of administrative failure, total. Uh, it was a case of... So who do you think should take responsibility? Is it... I will not minister? make a statement. I will not make a statement on that. Uh, the chief minister himself would know who is responsible, but it was a case of administrative failure. The, the home minister, perhaps, the home minister of the state. Whoever it was. Uh, I don't uh, comment on, on politicians or uh, on politics. Uh, I only deal with administrators. But since the chief secretary was not there, I had to go, and, uh, go to the chief minister uh, directly. Uh, we found out, I sent, I deployed a, a three battalions in Ahmedabad. So how long did it take then for the orders to come? No, the orders were So, no, how long did it take for you to get into the city then? The, oh, the transport came, the transport the came on s uh, 2nd at 10 o'clock. So, for a whole 24 hours or more than 24 hours? We were sitting, we at, were the sitting at the airfield. That's right. Not doing very much? That's right. Okay. So, then on the 2nd, you come out into the city we, and we, what do you see? I found mayhem. I found, uh, so we, we opened fire at the arsonists and uh, I think we killed two or three and wounded about 20. I had given strict orders that firing must be below the belt. Right. And that's why the casualties were less. Some casualties were carried away by, by workers of the right wing. Uh, so what do you mean? There were people? There were people who were shot, but they were carried away. We couldn't recover the bodies. Okay. We couldn't, uh, they, they were carried away to, maybe to hospitals or wherever they were. And there I found that uh, surrounded minority pockets with crowds being for the blood and the police firing into the windows of the buildings. So I said, what are you doing? They said, we are keeping the mobs at bay. I said, then fire the other way. So who, the, they were, the, the mobs police, were? The mobs. Were Hindu mobs? Majority. Okay. I never use religion. It was majority. The majority community. Community surrounding the minorities. See, there you, oh, have, okay. you have walled ghettos. Mm -hmm. In Ahmedabad. In Ahmedabad. Do you remember the names of these places like Juhapura? Juhapura and there are a whole lot I'm forgetting. Okay. But the police was totally biased, parochial, and um, they were letting fly at Muslims through the windows. The poor fellows are trying to uh, protect their buildings and they're firing through the windows. So I got very, very angry. And uh, But wherever majority mobs had to be dealt with, they never took action, it was left to the army. Or wherever the, the mobs of the majority community? No, the mobs were of the majority community. The minorities were all stuck and scared to death right. in, the, in their buildings. So the, you're saying the police took no action? At None all. at all. And why do you think that? No, I don't know. Uh, yes, I am aware that police forces all over the country have got totally communalized. I've seen it in my hometown in Meerut and Sardana. Totally communalized, totally parochial and unreliable. They cannot be trusted in a riot to, uh, because uh, they take sides. So that was, uh, it explains, it's a phenomenon all over the country. But you don't only. think this is true of the Indian Army? Oh, not at all. Otherwise, 
we won't have been able to um, to settle the thing within 48 hours. We had curbed violence uh, after they found that we meant business. And there is a danger of long-term deployment of the armed forces, right. of them getting, uh, well, uh, this thing rubbing off on them. And so that is why... So we'll talk about that, like for example, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in Jammu yes, and Kashmir I'll, I'll as well as in the Northeast. Right. But to finish the Gujarat story, so you settled, you quelled the riots in 48, 48 hours. hours. They were quelled. Um, so you come out into the city on the 1st of March and by the... No, time, 2nd of March. On the 2nd of March, that's yes, right, right, because from the 2nd of the March and by 4th, everything, all, all while, of course, there's enmity and, and, and abusing, and, but uh, no violence. So your experience was of the Gujarat police openly communal, taking sides in favor of the Hindus and against the Muslims. Absolutely. This, now, this is not only a phenomenon in Gujarat. And did you, did you report this to of the course, chief minister? Of course, it is all, well, I, I, of course, I didn't tell him that your police are communal, but uh, when the uh, defense minister asked me, I said, change the police chief, sack him. This is to George Fernandez. To George Fernandez, I said, change him. Um, so he says, you've taken the words out of my mouth. These were his very words, but nothing happened. They didn't change him. He was there right through. Yes, uh, several months later, Mr. Gill. KPS Gill. Uh, KPS Gill, who was given credit for Punjab and, right. and Gujarat. Right. Well, he just came in after the army right. had done his work. General, tell me, Ehsan Jafri, a former MP of the Lok Sabha, was killed during those li riots. Did, did you know about yes, that? Yes, I'm aware of it. And what do you think happened? Well, I, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I did read uh, reports that he had made several calls for help, mm -hmm. which were not responded to, and the building was surrounded. I am told that he fired. You are told, you didn't know. At I the don't time. know. I'm told they at fired. At the time, you didn't know? But it, that was in self defense, I'm sure. No, but you didn't know that, so you, nobody could have come to No, me no, I didn't know that, uh, that he had been killed and such things. I got to know later. And the worst part is that uh, the minority policemen, their houses were also burned in the police lines. I see. Can you believe it? At, you know, the, the, the way the police was acting. I mean, their own policemen in the police line, their own houses are burnt, were burnt. So the poor fellows didn't know what to do. So did you see therefore in front of you that the administration, the state administration, the, um, the, the political class, the home ministry, the, the other departments did not take action? Well, I was really interacting with the- to take action. Yes, I was interacting with the police because we had a police liaison officer, a director general of police. But you said you stay, and, but, so how long did you stay in, uh, in Gujarat and in Amdur? I was there for two and a half months. And I met Mr. Modi frequently. And? Uh, and I kept reporting. So he asked me, have you learned Gujarati? Yeah, I said, a few words I've learned. You know, uh, we were on the best of terms. He was very, very cordial, uh, gave me all the due respect, and for which I respect him. But, so let me ask you again, uh, this happened uh, 18, 16 years ago, of yes, course. Yes. But your memory is still fresh? Well, I had made my notes. And um, I had made my notes because uh, I had uh, rendered a report. So I went through my notes just to make sure I'm not wrong. Okay. Because if I make a blunder on the dates, I would be hung. No, apart from the dates, your memory of the riots. Those are um, of course it does. It is so disturbing to see see as i reported in my open letter to the to the to the prime minister when these gorakshaks were going um, unchecked and i said that uh, my i said it takes three generations to forget that was the heading of my letter and i said my family uh, did not migrate to pakistan because we were quite sure that in india we would be safe uh, those members of my family who were Muslim leaguers migrated. Mm -hmm. My immediate family didn't. We decided we'll brave it out here. Right. Uh, I did hear about partition and the horrors. There was no, no, nothing in my town because my grandfather had a firm grip, Sardhana. But I did hear of terrible stories of both sides. Sure. And there was a little kink in my mind. But uh, when I went to NDA as a boy, 15 years old, that kink was driven out because I was treated very fairly. I was treated, uh, I was the lone Muslim in my course. Nobody made me feel that. I was Zoom Shah and that's it. 
In fact, people tell me, uh, oh, you're a Muslim, we didn't know. You know, that sort of thing. This is what happens in the army. This is what it's all about. So to come back to Gujarat, my question to you is that, did you feel as a Muslim, you were an, you're an Indian army officer at the time you were serving, of course. But did you feel as a Muslim that, that these horrendous scenes that were being played out in front of your eyes, I mean, how were you reacting? I was not there to do a job as a Muslim. I was there to do a job as a general of a formation. And I did that. As you know, you can't allow your personal uh, well beliefs and everything else to interfere in the work you're doing. So I didn't allow that to, to affect me at all. I just did my job, plain and simple, what was expected of me. Sir, but I'm sure you've been asked, or I'm sure General Padmanabhan or other people have been asked in the Indian Army, why send a Muslim to Gujarat? Yes, I learned of this later, many years after that. In fact, in my books written. Of course, I did not take General Padmanabhan's name, but when I was asking him, he's, I said, sir, I've mentioned that uh, people were a little shocked that a Muslim had been sent to Gujarat. He said, yes, and you can quote me. You can give my name. So I said, all right, and I'm using his name. Uh, he and I have known each other since uh, 1990, okay. when I was his principal staff officer, sorting out the violence in Punjab. I see. You know, I've been in insurgency right through. We were sorting out the violence in Punjab. And I say, when people say that Muslim terror or Falana terror, no, no, I say they are bad elements in all religions. I've dealt with... So what happened? So to finish with Gujarat, what right. did he, when, when you were, or he, was he told that why is he sending a Muslim officer to Gujarat? He says he was, people were, advised him not to. And he said the decision of the leader and the troops is mine and nobody will interfere. I learned this much later. At that time, I didn't know. I didn't know about it. So I went there not as a Muslim. I went there as a general of a force who had a task to do and we did it. So at no time does your religion or your identity come in conflict? No. When I am in uniform, I am, my religion is the army. And then I don't allow a person, you know, per, the religion is my personal matter. I commanded Rajput troops, uh, Tate Hindus, uh, I also had to chop off a goat's head during the Shera. But I did it all and they expected me to do it. I When was this? Uh, this was when I was in my regiment as a second lieutenant. They said, Saab, abhi aap ki bari hai, the Shere mein. You know, they have the tradition sure. Of, sure. of that. And I did it because I had practiced. People had cautioned me they're going to make you do it. So I had taken a block of wood and practiced. So, now, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in where Muslim troops are involved, mm. when there are more than a hundred, then you authorize the mosque and a malvi. Right. And the commanding officer comes and reads namaz. So tell me, so, so for example, in 1971, General Jacob, and you fought in the 1971 yes. war as well, yes. General Jacob was Jewish. Right. But nobody ever said that he was right. Jewish, right? Right. So in the same way, do you feel that in the Indian army, at least, it's sort of the last bastion of secularism? It is the last bastion, but prolonged commitment on sorting out riots and other things is very, very harmful. It is injurious to the psyche of the soldier. And I would say that the second line of defense, the paramilitary forces, must be committed on sorting out these, these troubles. The army should not be committed. The soldiers hate doing this duty. So in Jammu and Kashmir, as well as in the Northeast, where we have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which means that the Indian Army is, is always at the ready. What do you think about that? Uh, people have asked me, and I couldn't have survived without the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. I have served many, many years in the Northeast. Uh, the soldier has to be assured that what he does in good faith is going to be defended. He won't he won't have to face a magistrate. But these acts have been there for now 25, 30, 30 That's right. Years. And that's why the army has been acting. If you withdraw it, they'll become like the police. They say, why should I get into trouble? If I shoot somebody, I'll be going to a magistrate for the rest of my but life. But it has to be, it has to pave the way for a political... Of course. Sort of a there is no right? military solution to an insurgency. So let me, let me bring you back, um, uh, General, to the time you were Vice-Chancellor at Aligarh Muslim University uh, and a very active Vice-Chancellor at that. Now, 
I know that at the time Smriti Rani, who is today the Textiles Minister, was the Human Resources Development Minister and you had some interaction with her. Yes. Is that an understatement? No, you, I think you are right. Uh, it, it may be an understatement. Okay. Uh, How would you describe it? Well, um, she took an instant dislike for me. Why is that? Because in my first meeting, when I went with my wife, as I generally do, when I have to meet, uh, when I have to, when I'm meeting persons of the opposite sex, or I'm calling on a minister, I, I said it's better to take my wife along. Okay. And uh, I told her the the good work the university was building. I also requested. I said uh, that uh, please don't meddle in the affairs of Aligarh Muslim University. The sentiments of the Muslim. Why do you think she wanted to meddle? No, I knew. I knew her. She had said it's not a minority institution and such things. I said don't meddle with that. It is a minority institution. I said I had taken. Oh no no. She said I don't want to discuss that. I'm not prepared. But I said, madam, it is a minority institution. And it is a minority institution because the Supreme Court has put a stake on the High Court order. So till that is uh, well overruled, AMU remains a minority institution. And then you had another, there was another exchange. No, with, so, with so anyway, I told her the, uh, the, uh, the research being done, she showed scant interest. She was more interested in the files. While I was briefing, she her. was not interested in what was happening. No, I had taken a laptop and I was trying to show her this is what we are doing. Okay. Uh, she was looking at something, uh, and then uh, I left. Then a few months later, I get a call from the Chief Minister, Mr. Oman Chandi of Kerala, of Kerala, saying that uh, Mr. Smithy Rani wants to close down the AMU Center at Kerala. We have centers That's right. in Kerala, Bihar, and uh, you know. Sure. So he says, please be part of the delegation because we want fin uh, funds to run the center. And appointed time in the in the office was given the HRD minister's office. Uh, Fifteen minutes before the time, I landed up. I didn't see a soul. So I asked the secretary, "Where's the HRD minister?" Oh, she says, "You didn't know." I said, "No, the venue has been changed." So I rushed off to Mrs. Smithy Rani's residence. Right. The meeting had already started. The chief minister of Kerala had left a, had left a, a guide for me. I was ushered in. Yes, who are you? I said, I'm Janan Shah. You know me well enough. Uh, I'm the, uh, the vice chancellor of AMU. Who invited you here? I said, the Kerala chief minister asked me to, to be part of the delegation. Who pays you? The government of Kerala, the central government? I said, right ma'am. I saluted and walked off because I had got the message that I was not welcome. The chief minister of Kerala, regrettably, didn't utter a word, mm -hmm. but he apologized profusely to me after the meeting. So then I believe you went, you took this, when you met the prime minister subsequently, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. You also I did. I met the prime minister um, about two weeks after that. And you told him. I took a delegation. And uh, there, after we had discussed the problems, I requested five minutes with the prime minister separately. I told him the treatment meted out to me. Uh, By Smriti Rani. Yes, and uh, he said something which I, is close to me, but I'll not reveal. But what did he say? Was he reassuring? Was he? Um, well, he said something your... which which uh, reinvigorated me. Okay. And so I went back and reassured. And then uh, I reported to the HRD minister saying that I would like to meet you. She had never given me a meeting after the first meeting. And I was straight away summoned okay. because I said I want to tell you what I told the the prime minister. And she gave you time. So I gave. I went with my deputy, who was a brigadier. I, uh, you last that you filled up the university with with, with military. Men. No, <laughs> see, it is such a right. difficult task that I had to have people who I trusted implicitly. So anyway, so then you met. So I I, I met the the prime minister with my delegation. Hmm. No, and you met then the HRD minister. Oh, then I met the, yeah, yeah. the HRD minister. To my shock, when I entered the office, there were three MPs. The whole hierarchy of the MHRD sitting there to, uh, well, to... So she had really laid out the red she carpet. She had laid, not the red carpet. <laughs> they wanted to grill me and drive me into the ground. Well, at least, uh, you know, she, they, they, she did call you and she, you did have a conversation. Yeah. So my last question to you, General, before we end, is about your celebrity brother Nasiruddin Shah, right. the star of Bollywood. Right. Uh, well, he's written, uh, I'm always, the news always says, uh, Nasir's elder brother nominated as deputy chief of army. Right. 
Right. I put it in my book. Sure. How do you feel about that? I don't mind it because he's the best actor in the country. Oh, good. And I'm his ardent fan. I am really am. I never see movies, but his movies I don't. Uh, I always see. So the brothers uh, do get along and uh, you... We are, we, we, we are an unbeatable tennis partners. Uh, we've challenged army teams and beaten them. We, when he came to Aligarh Muslim University, we challenged the 2,000 teachers. We said, select your gladiators. And we'll play a match. We, they did and we beat them. So we hope that the brothers and your wives and your spouses and your families, I'm sure all of you will live happily ever after, just oh, yes. like a lovely Hindi movie. We, we are a tightly knit family and uh, Nasif is very self-effacing. Okay. He gives me a lot of credit as he says uh, that I motivated him. Uh, so it's how brothers think about each other. General Zamiruddin Shah, thank you so much for speaking. It was a pleasure. This is Jyoti Malhotra for The Print.